Hi, thanks for spending time here at the North Coast World War II Museum with us today. My name is Kevin Meyer, I'm the museum coordinator, and I'll give you a brief tour through the facility today. Okay, uh, the building is in an original, uh, built in 1914 for the Hungarian Orthodox mm -hmm. congregation that was coming into town. Uh, the original structure of the congregation remained intact until they donated the museum to us in the early 2010s. By about 2013, the congregation had reached the point that they were no longer meeting regularly and the museum opened, softly opened. Within two years, we were open full time. One of the features that we have, we have the original church bell upstairs in the steeple and attached to the clapper of the bell is the old original rope to pull it and get the bell ringing. Now, what year did the, the museum open? The museum opened officially in 2015. One of our newts displays is Emma Gladys Foster. She served in the U.S. Army Nurses Corps towards the end of the, the war, 1944 through the end of the war. And this is her original uniform with a photograph of her in training. And again, that was with the Nurses Corps, so a wax uniform, officer's uniform. The uh, WAVES uniform here is also an enlisted. Uh, women accepted for volunteer emergency service is the WAVES uniform. Women played a vast role, not only on the home front, but also uh, filling in a lot of supply areas and serving in areas to free up men, especially in the medical and in this case, in the WAVES machinist mates as well. Uh, it freed up the men to, to, to serve in other very important areas, but the women also served overseas as well. Most of them did serve here on the home front. Nurses Corps being one of the largest exceptions, and also the Red Cross. We have Greta, uh, Grace Loomis's uniform here from the Red Cross. Grace was actually a nurse here at Brown Memorial Hospital for several years after the war. And her story is, is also told here at the museum in the binders, as well as the first wave from Crawford County, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Wright Owens. Uh, and her story is here too. Her, her claim to fame, as she told it was, she was famous for being a sharpshooter shooter. She scored 49 out of 50 on the prone position on the firing. These two cases we have updated with several items Typical items that soldiers, local soldiers have donated and their families have donated to us. Uh, things such as the Bibles that they carried, individual stories, framed display cases, telling the stories of, of the service records of these local folks. Uh, most of our stories that we have are from the immediate tri-state area uh, or some connection to this area, but we accept any story of any soldier that may have served. Uh, so we see things in here such as the dice, some trinkets that were made out of, out of bullets that they sent home to loved ones, some personal items, some, some paperwork and photographs, uh, just, just kind of a personal connection of, of what soldiers may have saved and kept with them as a memento of what they served in the war. One of our initial uh, collections given to us was by Bert Drennan. His dad served in the war. There were several love letters that, are, that have been shared with various museums, as well as personal mementos. Uh, Bert Sr. served in the, or Jr. actually served in the, uh, uh, or attended Valley Forge Military Academy, and then graduated as an officer into the Marine Corps. And there's several items here. As we move into the Marine Corps, there's also a few bring back items, a pair of binoculars in here that a family brought back, a soldier brought back, gave to his family as his memento that he found on an island in the Pacific. As well as the additional items over here, we have the Marine dress uniform, a couple other Marine uniforms. Uh, Sergeant Mathay over here actually served in the South Pacific, saw combat in uh, Tinian, Iwo Jima, and several of the other South Pacific islands. And in this case, we have some items that he brought back as personal mementos, including a amphibious naval bandana, similar to what the Japanese kamikaze pilots we see often, that they all had a bandana around their head with the Japanese flag. The Japanese naval forces, their equivalent of the Marines, also had their own uh, bandana, if you will, that they carried with them. 
And we have a bring back here from Sergeant Bethea who served on a tank crew in the South Pacific. The things we attempt to do at D-Day as well as here at the museum is to tell the story of the war as unfiltered as possible through the eyes of the soldiers that actually fought. And one of the things we have here uh, that is, is a, a large a, of a large importance to our collection is our Nazi memorabilia and, and items that have been brought back from soldiers from this area that fought as their mementos of the war. And we see such items here as the large banner up here, the large party banner, down to the smaller ones, and we have three or four other of various sizes. Daggers as well as weapons of all kinds were also very popular to bring back. We do have a few examples of daggers in our collection as well as a reproduction uh, dagger that's, that's made it into the collection here. In this area, in these two cases, we have uh, a small collection about the actual events of D-Day. Uh, there's paperwork in here showing maps, some items that tourists have brought back from the current day that have very good descriptions of the battle and showing the various maps. Uh, one of the highlights of this collection is gas masks back that, that we have here. All of the soldiers carried with them a gas mask bag and a gas mask as they as they landed on the beaches. There was a very real concern that poison gas was going to be used during World War II as it had during World War I. Fortunately, that didn't happen, but they still came on board carrying these rubber uh, rubberized canvas cases with the gas mask inside. And what we have here is a reproduction case and also this brown uh, kind of trashy looking thing here was actually dug up off of the beach of Normandy back in the 90s. And it is an original D-Day relic from Utah Beach that uh, was dug up by someone over there. You can see that it's the gas bag. There's enough of it there to identify it as well as some webbing and some snaps that have rotted into that, that piece, which indicates that it laid there probably as part of the entire pack and was pounded into the surf, into the sand, and rotted until it's found several years later. What I understand is that when everybody found out they didn't need the gas mask, they, they wanted to travel as light as possible, so they just dumped them on the beach. They did. They, they lost them as soon as, they, as soon as they could, and a lot of them, they, they realized it was a problem. A lot of full packs went off when they realized they couldn't get as close to the beach as they had hoped. So as we see in the movies, the depictions are very real. Several of these individuals, of the soldiers went overboard into waist deep or higher water, carrying anywhere between 50, 80, 100 pounds on their backs and literally had to jettison as much as they could just to make it to shore, as well as once they got to shore, something like the gas mask bag very quickly uh, was, was removed from their carriers. On the stage this year, we have a display similar to the items that you'd find in Camp Life. We have uh, actually even have an original sleeping bag and liner and other items that the soldiers would customarily have had. But the highlight of our stage is our display is the mural, uh, the large two, two canvas mural that was painted for us by Matthew Danko. Uh, Matthew's a professional artist who uh, who did this for a display and exhibited it in, a, in, a, in an art display and then after the display donated this to us. Uh, and what's special about the photo is as you look at the faces, several of the uh, individuals, each face basically tells a story from the old veteran, uh, or you're the old grizzled veteran that's coming ashore with his hand on the shoulder in the far side of the young, of the, of the young soldier knelt in prayer to, to the medic with the grim face, medic ready to go, and, and towards the back of the boat, you know, you, you see over in the corner with the flag, uh, again, one of the, the more grizzled guys ready to go and comforting the younger men as they move forward. And of course, towards the middle, we have the chaplain prominently urging the men on as, as the landing craft unloads on the beach. The name of the uh, the mural is Redemption Draws Nigh by Matthew Dangle. Oh, yeah. Our town of Conneaut Honor Roll is from the home front area during the D-Day event, which is held in each August, uh, to prominently display the names of those either acknowledged as being from Conneaut by the War Department or with a direct connection to Conneaut, such as the case of the Neal brothers, Kenneth and Robert Neal, that are listed here. We have about 42 uh, KIAs with the direct 
connection to Kanya among those from this area that gave the uh, gave all so that we can enjoy the freedom that we have today. Uh, soldiers invariably found themselves with a lot of spare time. So this display covers some of the stationery that various soldiers collected. And it was a thing that as they were stationed, especially in training and moved from base to base, they would be writing home and on various different stationery and then also saved and collected the stationery, matchbooks, and other items from the, where they had served. And the highlight of this case is, has to be our, our care kit. The Pratt family in the corner here had this care kit packaged up and sitting on a shelf for World War II and for decades until it was donated to the museum. And as I understand it, it was what the soldier in the family had asked to be sent to him. He had sent home and requested. And specifically what's in this care kit was a box of sugar and two cans of Pap's Blue Ribbon beer and one all important, probably the most important thing, a can opener for the beer because it required the church key opener back in those days to open the cans. We get a lot of questions about whether the beer may still be good. I'm not willing to try it, but, but there it is. It's definitely uh, you know, coming up on 70 to 80 year old cans of beer. So what I understand is that they never sent it to him and they put it away someplace and forgot about it and decades later they found it and donated it to the and donated it to yeah. the museum exactly yeah I, I believe he was one place and then stationed somewhere else and it just kind of did not end up following him from place to place yeah. so this is our air core uh, all of the items that you're seeing that you've seen so far and you'll see throughout have been donated to us they're either on loan or most of them were outright donated we have a rather large collection of army air corps from area men that served, including uh, Lieutenant Marcy, who was a pilot of B-17s during World War II. Uh, his story is here. Uh, his ship actually was shot down, crash landed, and several of us in town know that uh, Lieutenant Marcy carried, uh, carried that with him for the rest of his life. Uh, Lieutenant Tech Sergeant Getze, I'm sorry, Tech Sergeant Getze was a Conneaut native who also served in the Air Corps. He had the misfortune of serving uh, in a B-24 and was ended up being shot down on his 16th mission. Uh, he was taken prisoner and subsequently died in captivity as he was trying to escape uh, one of the forced marches as the, uh, uh, the war was coming to an end. It's a very sad story that's told here at the museum. And we have not only his photo from his family, but also his original diary of his mission diary. The pilots or the, of the entire air crew at that point were required to complete 25 missions. Tech Sergeant Getty, as Getsy as several of the individuals did, filled out a blank diary to describe missions 1 to 25 and unfortunately in, in Tech Sergeant Getsy's case his diary ends after him describing the 15th mission because he was shot down on the 16th. Okay. This year we were thrilled to receive the collection from the estate of Dr. Lynn Newman. Dr. Newman was a longtime dentist in Andover, uh, nearby Andover, Ohio. Uh, but Dr. Dr. Newman had one of the most unique stories and first missions of any any gunner that served that that I've ever had the opportunity to read. It's a rather large collection that he sent to us, as well as his personal story, uh, which I'll come back to. But part of the collection. Uh, Dr. Newman was a sergeant at the time, served in the Air Corps as a gunner. And we have his original long underwear that he'd have worn underneath. And then what's something that we're very proud to have is his original sheepskin pants that the bombers wore. They had long underwear on and then they actually had heated long underwear that plugged in because they're fighting at 20,000 feet in minus uh, 70 degree or colder temperatures. So they actually are on oxygen at that altitude and then all exposed skin had to be covered and not only covered but they also as I said they had heated underwear that were plugged in uh, which was a constant problem. One of the main losses of airmen during the war in the 8th Air Force was due to hypothermia with literally freezing to death while they were on their bombing runs. Dr. Newman also in his original helmet, uh, Dr. Newman joined the war in 1942 and he was flying out of Italy and found himself flying out of Italy in 1943 to bomb Romania. Uh, 
the stories of our pilots and our, our airmen being shot down and interred in Switzerland is well known. But Dr. Newman, on his first mission, did have the misfortune of being shot down. Seems to be a recurring theme of our, of our airmen collection here. Uh, but Dr. Newman's story is a little unique. Several of the, of the airmen did bail out and actually they were never found. But four of them, four remained in the plane and crash landed uh, in Hungary. And we'll leave the story there, but they had a very unique experience for the rest of the war by landing in what was supposedly neutral Hungary and the internment that followed for the rest of the war. And in this area, we have a small naval display, uh, including items from local veterans Johnny of Johnny's Market over on uh, Conneaut's east side. Those of you that go back into the 70s or 80s and certainly before will we'll remember Johnny, as well as uh, uh, Andy Simkovich, who's a, a local veteran from Girard, Pennsylvania. Andy actually was a driver of one of the landing craft, one of the Higgins boats on Normandy, as well as additional landings. Uh, invasion landings during World War II. Uh, he's a frequent attendee over here at the museum and, and uh, we share some of his story here. While visiting the North Coast World War II Museum, be sure to check out the display of Conneaut's most famous or infamous wartime personality, Mildred Gillers. She was born in Maine in 1900 and moved to Conneaut in 1916, where she later graduated from high school. Her interest in the arts took her to Germany during World War II, where she became the Third Reich's propaganda machine, broadcasting on radio to American troops that their girlfriends were cheating on them at home and they should give up the war effort. Gee, girls, isn't it a darn shame? All the sweet old American summer atmosphere which the boys are missing now. Just imagine sitting out on the old uh, back porch in a sweet old rocking chair and listening to the birds at twilight. Instead of that, the boys are over there in the hot, sunny desert, longing for home and for what? Fighting for our friends. Well, 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 since when are the British our friends? Now, girls, come on, be honest. As one American to another, do you love the British? Well, of course the answer is no. Do the British love us? Well, I should say not. But we are fighting for them. We are shedding our good young blood for this kite war, for this British war. When the war ended, she was arrested in the United States and placed on trial for treason. She was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Gillers was paroled in 1961, and in a news conference in her half-sister's yard in Conneaut, maintained she did nothing wrong. Gillers became a music teacher. She died of colon cancer on June 25, 1988. Her life has been made into a new film, American Traitor, The Trials of Access Sally, starring Al Pacino as her attorney. You are right now, at this very moment, the most hated person in America. Eight counts of treason. The White House confirming this evening, American forces have struck Berlin. This is Berlin calling. With the right words, the war can be won before the first rifle is loaded. It is propaganda. What chance do you have? Prosecution. He's going for the death penalty. I'm your lawyer. Nobody wanted the case. Mildred Gillers utilized a German propaganda machine to weaken the American war effort and to destroy the morale of our troops. That is the definition of treason. Welcome down to the basement. The basement uh, feature of our basement is a, a, a home front area similar to what a house in Conneaut may well have looked like during World War II uh, with a few uh, Shout outs to the local Hungarian immigrant family since this is the Hungarian Orthodox Church. One of the highlights of, of our museum, my favorite item by far, is this display here. Uh, the in-service, sun in-service banner with 23 stars on a wooden frame listing the name of the service members. Sun and service banners such as this became popular during World War I and came back in in a large way to show our, uh, the patriotic fervor of the country during World War II. 
-hmm. A blue star denotes a son or a family member in service with the gold star, small gold star placed over a blue star reserved for the highest honor of, of a, someone who's given their life, a soldier who died in service to the country. Uh, this particular banner contains 23 blue stars. It was made by the women of this congregation during World War II. The frame was made by the, by the men here, some of the local carpenters. And it was originally made with 13 large stars in the shape of the V for victory to denote the names of the 13 soldiers that were serving uh, down here. And then as the war progressed, you'll see that additional stars were placed filling in the center and expanding the design with their names also added to the bottom here. Each of these individuals did come back, and if you're familiar with the area, you may well recognize some of some of the very familiar Conneaut names here and local names. Uh, but I think it's just super. It's literally something that has survived not only the war intact, but survived here in this church, and now is, is the keynote artifact uh, honoring uh, the repurposing of this old building into a museum. So what we've done in the home front area, as I said, is recreated what a typical uh, lower to middle class family would have been looking at in World War II, uh, living here in Conneaut, and the way it may have affected them. So as we go through, you'll see a bedroom with a sitting area and a vanity, uh, photos of the son that's serving on, on the vanity here, and, and sort of all the accoutrements of what you would normally find sitting around in the house as much as we've been able to. Again, this area being the bedroom, and then we come into a sitting area with the Victrola uh, clothes laid out, the, uh, the magazines laying out, our, our music based and photo play. Of course, this is the time period before TV, but movies were very large during the war. Uh, and everyone was following along what their favorite star was doing, what they were doing for the war effort, etc. This area is set up to display uh, you know, the typical homemaker doing her sewing. Uh, one of the things that was very common, uh, a lot of grain and other materials came in sackcloth, and you may have heard the term sackcloth. This is what we're talking about when we talk about having old clothing made out of sacks. This is an original sackcloth with a, a very colorful uh, floral pattern on it. And we have set up here the pattern for turning this into a dress, such as you see displayed on the form here. Two other things of note here in our display area, we talked about how uh, the war effort did really permeate every way, but there was still a sense of humor among those here on the home front, as there always was. And one of the hot novelty items came to us, uh, was donated to us uh, just last year. It was found in a local rummage sale at uh, one of our local churches and picked up uh, for, for next to nothing in a broken condition and one of our patrons paid to have it repaired at a local uh, ceramic shop. They did a fantastic job, and it is this, put a pin in the axis, Hitler pin cushion, where you have the ability literally to put a pin in the axis uh, of Adolf. Uh, and one of the other things I'd like to point out are the red, white, and blue knitting needles up here in the corner of the shelf with the navy scarf that's being knitted. Those are literally Aunt Myrtle's knitting needles donated by her great niece. She carried those knitting needles with her throughout the war in her apron as well as with a ball of wool and would constantly be knitting anytime her hands were idle while she was going about her daily business. She'd be knitting for the Red Cross's efforts. Um, a lot of these items went over to soldiers based on the color of that and the fact that it's a scarf, I have no doubt that was destined for uh, uh, someone serving in the Navy. Welcome to the kitchen area. The way we have it dis uh, displayed this year, we have uh, the dining room set for either a formal lunch or, or a light dinner um, with all original period items. The kitchen is all original items. It's a, it is a late 1930s original stove. It's one of the first ones that was not the monitor top with the large condenser unit up on top here. It is a working refrigerator. What we're sh showing uh, the original stove is a 1923 stove. Uh, and what we're depicting is baking today. Uh, food preparation during the time of the war, just like everything else, was drastically impacted 
because of, and specifically in the case of food, due to rationing. Virtually anything you can think of was rationed, from, from food items such as meat, uh, all cuts of meat, uh, produce, etc., etc., right down to gasoline, tires, rubbers. Uh, the rubber used on the tires was, was in very great demand. Uh, so what we're seeing here, she's not only baking cookies today, but she also knows what her allotment of sugar is going to be for the next several months. So she's trying to determine with the poundage of sugar that she has, just what is she going to be able to can out of the garden and what's going to have to be used immediately or maybe traded with neighbors to be able to sustain the family's food needs for the next several months. So this area represents the typical victory garden that the family would have. And this victory garden specifically display is dedicated to Edward Dixon. And uh, longtime Conneaut residents would know Mr. Dixon from Dixon's Stop and Shop on Broad Street, which I understand is where Conneaut Sub Shop is now. Uh, Mr. Dixon had one of the largest victory gardens in Conneaut over on the east side. Uh, and he served, he, he, was, he was able to grow enough produce not only for his own needs, but also to sell to the, at the store as well as provide a good number of families in the community that were in need uh, out of the abundance that he was able to grow out of, to grow and several of the items that you see on display here were donated from Ed's family to us in honor of Ed to, to commemorate his his victory garden and we also have a victory garden outside in, the, in our backyard that's planted with what you would typically be expecting to see in a victory garden from the 1940s if you come on the right day too and stuff's ripe you may be able to take home Absolutely. some vegetables you're 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 welcome <laughs> to taste test anything out there in season that's available we have a very large collection of paperwork here at the museum including original world war ii posters uh produced by the government uh as well as you know newsweek and life magazines but a lot of official paperwork issued by the government explaining the war explaining what what needed to be done uh, what you could do to help. Uh, most of these items have been donated to us from the Geneva Public Library, a very large donation that had come their way um, that they passed on to us. And as you move through the museum, you'll see lots of posters, originally framed posters on the walls, as well as displays of paperwork similar to what we're seeing here. No visit is complete without a quick visit to our gift shop. We have a large selection of D-Day themed materials, as well as uh, we try to find original World War II items or vintage items from the period. So you never know for sure what you're gonna find. Uh, we have the latest year's t-shirts, collectible coins and patches from D-Day and from the D-Day event available. Uh, so be sure to stop on out. Our hours this year, we're open from Memorial Day to Labor Day, Saturdays and Sundays and holidays, noon to five, and there will be outside displays most of those days that we're open, weather permitting, involving reenactors and other original World War II themed displays. And people are encouraged to go out and talk to them and, and what their duties would have been. And you see neat things like period cameras and you know photographers and, and different things. Right, pretty much every weekend we have a different group of reenactors coming out and setting up. And like I said, because of the changes and the way things are going, especially this year, I don't have a firm date to tell you where anybody's going to be here, but we will have displays of the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Uh, I know that the 82nd Airborne, the Rangers are going to be here as well. The Marines are expected back, the 1st Marine Division are expected back this year. Uh, our friends with the 29th Infantry Living History uh, are, are going to be making an appearance this year. Um, several weapons demonstrations and other, and you really never know what you're going to see. When you're out and about pretty much every weekend, Feel free to stop on down. Uh, everything's free. The outside displays are free. Uh, we accept donations. Everything that you're seeing, uh, not just cash donations, but all of the items. If you have any World War II items, and I encourage you to talk, as Bob said, I encourage you to talk to your the reenactors that we have here. Our docents and especially our reenactors love to interact and educate. It's all part of our mission that we have of educating and remembering about World War II.